This entire video is also available as a digital ebook. It's gonna be available on my website. There'll be a link in the description below. The book is not mandatory, it's not necessary. All of the same information will be in this video, but it's good to have, you can reference it anytime. And it's a good way to help support me and what I do making all of these videos. Thanks to my friends at b and I've had the excellent opportunity to try and evaluate pretty much every full frame mirrorless camera on the market. And I instantly fell in love with the A9. Within two days, I purchased this camera and the 100 to 400 G Master lens. It's an excellent camera for the things that I like to do. And I've had it for about six months now. And during this six month period, I've spent a lot of time with the camera and I've had a lot of people ask me to make a setup guide showing them how I set up and use this camera. That's what this guide is. I've been waiting a little while, putting my time in, waiting for firmware version five, um, which by the way, this guide references firmware version five. If you're using an earlier firmware version on this camera, it probably won't make any sense to you. You need to go update your firmware. This is not a complete guide by any means. This is a guide showing you how I set up and use this camera for wildlife and bird photography. But the cool thing about how I've set it up is you can use it for any type of photography once it's set up. Street photography, portrait, landscape, sports, it doesn't really matter. This setup will work for pretty much everything. This guide does not cover setting up and using the A9 for video. That's gonna be something down the road. This is just for photography. And remember that this is a highly customizable camera. There are probably dozens of ways to set this thing up. The way I've set it up might not be the right way, might not be the wrong way, might not be the best way, but it's what has helped me capture some incredible images, and I'm more than happy to share that with you. And just remember, if you're new to this camera, it's an extremely fast camera. It shoots 20 frames per second. You have to be very conservative with it. Just take those special moments, otherwise you'll be spending a long time, a lot of your life, looking through a bunch of in-focus shots. That sounds like a good thing, but trust me, when you have 200 shots that look almost exactly the same, it can be a huge time suck. So just be conservative with it. So let's jump right in and set this thing up. All right, before we get into the menus and all the electronic stuff this camera does, let's check out these mechanical buttons and how we need to have them set up to do what we wanna do. First thing we're gonna do is we're gonna change these two dials that are on the upper left of the camera. Um, the first one that we're gonna change is actually the bottom. And we want it to say AFC. We want AFC uh, to line up with this white hash mark. That's autofocus continuous. And to change this dial, you press in this button here and then you turn this knob up here on the front. See, it's got a little groove on it. And then that will move or rotate this bottom dial and we want it to be on AFC, which it is there. Now we need to set this top dial. In order to move the top dial, you just press this little button here and then you rotate the dial like this. We want it to be on H for high speed continuous. That's one of the things we need to do to unlock the incredible insane speed of 20 frames per second. And while we're at it, there's another dial over here. It functions the same way. You press in this top button and then you turn the dial. We want it in manual, or at least I do. I highly suggest shooting in manual mode. It gives you complete and total control over your camera. Another important mechanical feature of this camera is what Sony refers to as the control wheel, this dial on the back of the camera. But it's much more than a dial. It's actually four buttons. If you were to break it up into four different sections, like a north, a south, an east, and a west, or an up and a down, and a left and a right, you could actually do something with each of these presses. And we'll be assigning different functions to each one of these, an up and a down, a left and a right. Um, but this also serves as a dial that can be turned clockwise and counterclockwise. And if you're in the menu system on this camera, give me a second to boot it up, you can actually navigate through the menu by pressing up or down, left or right, with this dial or these buttons I was just telling you about. If you are reviewing your pictures, and you have a group of pictures that you wanna check out, you can actually go through them, scroll through them pretty quickly with this dial. If by chance you wanted to zoom in on one of these pictures, you could press the magnifying glass, and then you can use this dial to adjust the magnification of that image. And this same thing works through the viewfinder and on this rear monitor. It's a really powerful tool. And this center button acts as an enter. This is what you'll be using to confirm all of your selections, this center button right here. There are a couple accessories I suggest with this camera. 
The body of the camera itself, you can see it's really small. If you have, you know, somewhat decent sized hands, it's kind of, it's too small. I prefer getting the grip. The grip actually gives more to hold on to. If you like it because it's small, then, you know, don't worry about the grip. But the grip gives you a couple of extra features. You can shoot vertical and all the buttons and dials and everything are mirrored for that type of shooting. The grip also holds two batteries. So I can carry two batteries at once with me. The camera just feels more balanced to me with the grip. Again, it's really just a personal preference, but I like it with the grip. If you wanna get the 20 frames per second, Sony suggests using a high-speed SD card. And of course, Sony is nice enough to manufacture one of those. This card uh, has a read speed of 300 megabytes per second and a write speed of about 299 megabytes per second. Um, it's a Sony, looks like a G card. I'm not too sure actually you know, what the classification is other than it's really fast. You can tell too that it's the fast card because it has actually two rows of teeth on the back. It's important to note that Yes, the A9 has two card slots. Apparently that's a really big deal with some people, um, but only one slot accepts these high speed cards and that's slot number one. And that card goes in with the teeth facing out. The other probably most used and one of the most important mechanical buttons on the A9 is the actual shutter release. And by default, the shutter release has two functions. If you press and hold that shutter release in, of course, it's gonna open and close the shutter and take a picture. Also, half pressing will activate autofocus. By the time we're done with this guide, it will not do that any longer. We're gonna remove the ability to focus from that half press. Um, we're gonna be using a method of focus that's called back button focus. So by the time we're done, this shutter release button will do just that. It will only open and close the shutter or take a picture. Don't worry about removing the ability to focus from the half press on there. We're gonna assign focus to some buttons on the back. And it's actually can help you capture more images in focus doing this. And I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, for instance, like if your subject is moving, you're gonna be holding a button in the entire time your subject is moving. And it's gonna be activating continuous focus. If your subject was stationary, you can press the focus button once not the shutter, the, we're gonna be using the AF on button here on the back. You can press that once to acquire focus and then let go. As long as your subject or you are not moving forwards and back or backwards, that subject will always be in focus. So the idea behind this is you don't want the camera automatically switching the plane of focus when it shouldn't. And here's a good example of that. Suppose you have, say, a bird perched up on a branch in some glorious light, and you have the half shutter press still functioning as focus. If that bird were to move, it might reacquire focus on the wingtip and you might lose focus on the most important part of the bird, say the bird's face. By removing the ability to focus from the shutter button, if you acquire focus with the back button, which is how we're gonna be doing this, on the bird's face, and then let go, you're no longer focusing, you know you've got focus locked on the bird's face. If that bird flips its wings all around, the camera's not gonna reacquire focus on one of those wingtips and blow that series of shots. The bird will always be in focus as long as you have your shutter speed set accordingly. It can take a little bit to get used to that, to breaking the habit of using this half shutter to focus, but this is much better, much more efficient. By the time we're done, this whole camera is gonna be set up to where you can access several different focus modes without ever removing your eye from the viewfinder or going into the menu. You're just gonna move from one button to the other. It's extremely powerful, extremely fast. All right, before we start making changes, let's, let me go ahead and go in and explain the Sony menu system to you. For some reason, there's this rumor that Sony menus are hard to navigate and don't make much sense, but actually that's not true at all. They're really easy to navigate and they actually make a lot of sense. Let me show you what, how it works. So if you come in here, I've hit the menu button on the top, you'll see all of these tabs. There's one, two, three, four, five, six. You got a camera one, camera two, a little globe, a play, a toolbox, and a star. Think of all of these as your main categories or tabs. Underneath each one of these, you will have a bunch of different sub-menus or choices. So if we wanna navigate from one to the other, we don't want anything highlighted down here, and we just use the control wheel and it'll bounce from one, main subject or one main category to another. If we want to navigate a sub menu under here, we move down. And now I can start navigating all of these things and making my changes. 
And it's really important to take note of this over here in the right. It's a little fraction, 1 13th. This is telling us that we're actually on page one of 13 with this, within this menu. If we go one to the right, it changes to page two. If we go two, one more, it changes to page three. Pretty simple stuff. Here's a couple tips for you too. If you're ever in the menu and you feel lost and you wanna panic, um, take note of these two buttons right here. It tells you down the bottom right that menu is an arrow going backwards. So menu will take you backwards, which is taking me out of the menu. And then the garbage icon has a question mark. It's kind of a weird place to put the question mark. But if you're on anything and it's highlighted within the menu and you touch the garbage icon, it's not gonna delete anything. It's actually gonna give you more information about whatever was highlighted. So it's a good way to get a little bit more information about what you might be doing to the camera with your changes. And as one last um, precaution, if you're ever stuck in the menu and you feel like you're lost, and you don't want to save anything, just half press the shutter button and it'll knock you right out of the menu and you'll go right into photo shooting mode. It's kind of a quick way to get out of the menu system without making any changes or saves. All right, let's jump into the menu and start setting this camera up. So first thing I'm gonna show you is how to actually make a change. I'm gonna shoot, be shooting in raw. So as you can see it's highlighted in orange. I'm gonna press the center button here and I'm gonna get the, the extra list here are the more choices um, being that i've already selected raw i'm gonna go ahead and select jpeg see how it chose and switched over to jpeg switch it back to raw that's how you're gonna make changes to all of these i'm not going to go into too much more detail about that i'm just going to tell you why all of these settings are what they are from this point on so i'm going to be shooting raw if you shoot raw or if you don't i highly suggest that you're going to need some kind of post-processing software to process those raw files you get more power that way. You get more dynamic range. You have more creative ability with a RAW file than you do with the JPEGs. So I highly suggest shooting RAW. It's not that big of a deal. Um, it's actually quite easy and a lot of fun. It's part of the process. Next line on here is RAW file type compressed. That's very important. If you want to shoot 20 frames per second, and I think you probably do, that's why I bought this camera, then you want to choose compressed. You're going to have to shoot compressed RAW files to get that speed. The next one, JPEG quality and JPEG image size are irrelevant because we're not actually shooting JPEG. The aspect ratio is the default aspect ratio of the image, 3 by 2 This is pretty interesting, the APS-C slash super 35 millimeter auto. What that's doing is if by chance you have a DX or a crop sensor lens and you put it on this full frame camera, it might not function properly. By having this on auto, it's telling the camera to go ahead and crop to that lens so that that lens will then work properly. So let's go ahead and move to the right. And we're gonna move to the next part of the menu. We're gonna go to the quality image size two, which is actually page two of 13. You are notice these first two options are grayed out. They're grayed out, I believe, because we're shooting in RAW, and I'm not gonna use them anyway, so it doesn't matter. I'm not gonna be using long exposure noise reduction or high ISO noise reduction. Um, the color space I have selected is sRGB. There's a big, huge heated debate about this. No matter who you talk to, one person says RGB, sRGB, or Adobe RGB, and people fight about it all the time. You can go look it up yourself and watch all these people bickering about it, but I choose sRGB, you can choose whichever one you want. Lens comp, that's all set at default. I haven't done anything there at all. We were on two of 13. If we go to the right one, it's gonna mean we're on three of 13. Oh, wow. So the first section of self timer in bracket, I don't do anything here because I don't have a self timer set up. So this is all default. I don't bracket, that's default. This is grayed out because of the shooting uh, scenario that I currently have. I don't use the memory either. I find it too hard to actually push the button and turn the dials to recall the memories. So I've set this camera up, so I don't really need to do that. Select media, slot one, that's the default setting. This is really important, this reg custom shoot set. This is like having a completely different camera at the touch of a button. So instead of carrying two or three cameras with you, you can program two or three different shooting scenarios and then map them to a button. For instance, if you have a subject, say an Osprey that's flying really fast, you have to have a fast shutter speed to freeze that movement. But say the bird comes in and lands and it just starts eating a fish and it slows down. 
you have a choice at that point. You can lower your shutter speed, get more light into the camera, and maybe get a, a lower ISO while it's sitting perched. But if the bird flies away again, you're gonna miss the shot because your shutter speed is now too low. With this setting, you can program a slower shutter speed to be activated at the touch of a button, as well as a host of all kinds of other stuff. As soon as you let go of that button, the camera goes right back to the way it was before. So I'm gonna show you how I have it set up currently. And this is an area where you really wanna take your time and think about how you can customize this to best suit what you do. So I'm gonna highlight this red custom shoot, I'm gonna hit enter, and I'm gonna to go to one. So you get three, three different settings you can do. I'm gonna do recall custom hold one because I really only need one for myself. And man, this is a lot of stuff in here. I'm gonna go ahead and scroll down so you can see all of this information. So you'll notice that some of these selections have check marks and some of them don't. Because it, the ones that have check marks will actually have this value when I recall these custom settings. Um, so everything that has a check mark will have a predetermined value that I cannot change when I recall all of this information at one time. All of the ones that don't have check marks will inherit the values that were previous. So whatever shooting mode you were in, say you were shooting F8, when you activate these custom settings, the aperture would then inherit that value of F8. And same with everything else. So for me and what I do, when I recall this uh, custom settings, I'm gonna be shooting in manual mode. The aperture will inherit whatever aperture value I have already selected prior. My shutter speed is gonna be 1 500th of a second. The drive mode is gonna be whatever I had prior, which is gonna be high speed shooting. Exposure compensation, it's gonna be whatever I had prior. ISO is gonna to go to auto ISO at this moment. Metering mode is also gonna change. By default, I use multi-metering, multi -metering, but when I recall this, I'm gonna be using spot, and I'll explain why a little bit later. Focus mode, I want continuous AF. Focus area is gonna to change too to a small flexible spot, and AF on is gonna come on. So that means auto focus is gonna come on. So by the time I'm done with this, I map all of this to one button, I push that button, and all of these things change. I'll be shooting in manual exposure with a shutter speed of 1 500th of a second. I'll be with auto ISO, my metering mode will change to spot. My focus will be continuous and it will be auto focus as long as I'm holding that button. I let go of that button and all of my settings go back to the way they were. Now I changed my um, metering mode to spot because I want to meter the amount of light in a very small area when I'm using this, like say a bird perched on a branch and the camera will tell me to adjust exposure for just that area. And we need to link our focus area up to the spot metering. I'll show you how to do that later and I'll explain that later. So again, think about how you wanna set all this up. It's actually very powerful. It's like having a completely different camera at the touch of a button. And when you get it set up exactly how you want it, come down to register and hit this enter button. And then that's all set. And even for me at this point, I'm still kind of tinkering around with this idea. I don't know if this is how mine is gonna remain right now because I'm still playing with it. Um, I, I'm happy with it, but I might actually lower my shutter speed a little bit more for this. Uh, and once I have it registered, everything is good and ready to go. So we're gonna go back into the menu and we're gonna move on to the next page. So the next page we're gonna go to is page four of 13. Um, the first option, priority set and AFS is irrelevant because we're shooting an AFC. Uh, priority set and AFC, balanced emphasis. So what does this mean? Priority set and AFC uh, gives you the choice of telling the camera to always take a picture, regardless of whether the camera think it's, thinks it's in focus or not, or to only take a picture when the camera thinks the image is in focus or to balance it somewhere in between. There might be some that are out of focus, but and then some that are in focus. That's what balanced emphasis is. It's kind of a, a mixture of the two. The only caveat to this setting is you might lower the frame rate from 20 to 18 because there might be a few images that are out of focus and it'll skip those. I've never really had an issue with it. I put it right on balanced emphasis and I'm still getting an amazing amount of good shots. The next thing we need to look at is our focus area. You wanna set it up to zone. Um, zone is what I'm gonna be using about 80% of the time. I'll explain why a little bit later. Uh, focus settings, that's default value. 
This is really important. Focus area limit. If we click through to this, you can see that the A9 has, oh my gosh, I've never even looked or counted how many focus areas there are, but there's a lot of them. And in my experience, I really only ever use a handful, three or four of them. So we're gonna limit the amount of actual focus areas that we can choose from. It makes it easier a little bit later when we're trying to change stuff up. So you need to come in here and we need to highlight just three of these or check three of them. I go with zone, I'm gonna go with flexible spot L, and then right under that, tracking tracking with flexible spot L. And once I have all that, I'm gonna go ahead, hit okay. I've just removed all of the other focus areas from being selected, and that's okay, because I don't want them, those three do everything that I could ever need. We're gonna come down to the next one. That's a default setting. I haven't changed anything there at all. All right, we're gonna go ahead and jump to the next page. We're still in the main category of one, but we're gonna to move to page five of 13 now. This AF Illuminator Auto, that's a default setting. I haven't changed that. The face IAF set, I haven't done anything there. That's all default setting. This though, I've made a change here, this AF track sensitivity. And look at this, you have five choices. You have one locked on and five responsive. And I'll try to explain what this is doing and why I prefer it to be locked on. So this is telling the camera's autofocus system how sensitive you want it to be. So say that my hand is a tree and this is a bird flying by and you're locked onto this bird and the bird flies behind a tree. Do you want the camera to quickly change focus from the bird to the tree and then back to the bird or do you want it to remain locked on that bird at all times and ignore the tree? If you put it on a number of say five responsive, the camera will often shift focus from one object to another within the frame. And that might not be the subject that you intended. With it at a value of one, I have found that once you get a good lock on a subject, it will not let go. And that's what you want. And I mean, if a bird comes flying out of the sky at an insane speed, if you can keep it in the viewfinder, the camera will keep focused on it even when it comes crashing into the water. It's an amazing thing to do. Still challenging because you have to keep it in the viewfinder, but it's very, very helpful. Anything other than one, and it would often shift to something else. So I just keep it on one. All right, there's a couple more things we need to change in this same menu. Uh, the AF with shutter off. I talked about that in the beginning, how the shutter button will autofocus. We're turning it off. Select that, and boom. You can no longer autofocus by half pressing. You won't need to. We're gonna be using other buttons. This pre-AF, I also like to turn that off. If you don't, the camera will try to pre-focus within the focus area that you've chosen. Um, waste battery power because it's always trying to focus and it might not be focusing in the same spot you want it to. So I turn it off. All right, we're gonna jump to the next page. Are you ready? From five to six, whoa, 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 look at that. The I start AF is grayed out, so don't have, to, don't have to mess with that. AF area registration, you want that on, and we'll be setting up a completely separate focus area using that later, so make sure that's on. This would actually delete that setup, so don't do anything there, I don't think you need to. This AF area auto clear I have set to off. This is really important. Display continuous AF area, turn that on. I'm gonna explain to you, actually here, if you just watch on the screen, what this does. So I'm gonna go ahead and focus. You see all these little squares? That's feedback telling me that the camera is actually focusing. If we come in here and turn that display continuous AF area off, and we come back in, look at that, we don't get that feedback. I have no idea where the camera's focusing. That's no good. So make sure you come in and turn this on and you get all that awesome feedback telling you exactly where the camera is acquiring focus. You need that. It's very, very important. So we're gonna come back in. This bottom uh, selection, honestly, I don't even know what it is, but I've never changed it. It's uh, set up for the factory default at that value. All right, let's move from page six to page seven. AF micro adjust. This is interesting. If you think your camera is front focusing or back focusing, this is where you would rectify that problem. It allows you to actually shift the plane of focus forwards or backwards in small increments. I don't have that issue with my A9 in the 100 to 400, so I've done nothing there. I'm gonna go ahead and move on to the next page, page eight of 13. 
Exposure comp, that's default value. The reset EV comp, that's at default value. ISO setting is at default value, and I'm gonna assign that to a button a little bit later, so it doesn't really matter. Metering mode, I prefer this metering mode called multi. That's the little symbol right over there. And what it does is it averages out the entire scene and tells you how to expose for that average. Face, face priority and multi-metering is on. Focus point link. Now I talked about this when we were going over setting up like a whole custom suite of settings that you can recall at a buttons press. And I said that you need to link your focus area to spot metering. So wherever your focus area is, if it's a tiny little dot in the viewfinder, the camera will meter for that small spot. It's a great way to expose properly for just one area of the image. So you need to have spot metering point set to focus point link in order for that to happen. It's very important. You're gonna move over to the next page, which is page nine. And I don't do anything here. This is all default settings, but it's kind of important to note that exposure step is set to a third. That allows you to actually change your exposure in small increments. That's actually pretty cool. But the other two things, I haven't done anything here to change those. I'm gonna go over one more. Uh, look at that flash. Now, I don't know, there's a, I don't use flash for wildlife, so I'm gonna skip over this. I just don't think the animals dig it. So. I don't do anything with flash. I'm just gonna go right on to the next page, which is page 11. Color white balance image processing. White balance I have set for auto. The priority set in auto white balance is standard. This DRO auto HDR is off. Um, I don't want the camera trying to do any kind of HDR to any of my stuff. I don't want it doing any kind of processing either and wasting any kind of power. So I've turned that off. Creative style, I use standard, but I've made a change to this, and let me show you what that change is. So if you come in here and you crawl down, whoops, I mean to the right, you have the ability to change contrast, saturation, and sharpness. And you can see I've changed my sharpness to plus two. And let me explain what's happening with that and why I do that. So when you're shooting in RAW, this creative uh, preset, of standard has no impact on the raw file at all. It does nothing to it. So you might be thinking, well, why would you even have it on and why would you change stuff? What it does affect, it affects the JPEG preview that is written inside the raw file. So when you're reviewing an image on the back or you're in the viewfinder, you're actually looking at a JPEG preview that's written inside the raw file. And that JPEG preview has those settings that I just changed. So the JPEGs will have a little bit of sharpening applied to them. I personally like that. I wanna look at the back of the screen. I wanna go, oh man, yeah, that's, that's sharp. I can see that right now um, without having to worry about it. Without it being like that, you might think some of your images aren't too sharp. They might look too flat. Um, again, that's kind of just a personal preference. That's why I do that. So the images look a little bit sharper on this rear screen or in the viewfinder. This picture effect is off and it's grayed out anyway, so it's not available with RAW. The shutter auto white balance lock is off as well. I'm gonna go ahead and move to the next section, which is page 12 of 13. Focus assist, man, there's a lot of stuff here. And this is actually really cool by the time we're done setting this up. So we're gonna set the focus magnifying time to no limit. We're gonna set the initial focus magnification to times 4.7. We're gonna have AF and focus mag on, and we're gonna have manual focus assist on. I'll show you why we're doing all this in just a little bit, but let's check out this peak setting. Peaking or focus peaking is really cool. And here's the settings I'm gonna use. I'm gonna have a peaking display of on that turns on focus peaking. I have a peaking level high, and then the peaking color is red. I'll explain to you what this does, and then I can actually show you on the rear screen really quick. Um, focus peaking allows you to actually view an image and shows you exactly where the focus or the plane of focus exists within that image. Shows you what's in focus by highlighting it with a specific color that you've chosen. I've chosen red. So everything that's in focus would be highlighted in red when I'm in manual focus. And I've set the camera up to um, go to manual focus with just the touch of a button. We'll get to that a little bit later. You might not want to have it red if you're like photographing, I don't know, fall leaves in Vermont where they have a lot of red color. If you're in 
Colorado doing fall leaves from the San Juan Mountains, you probably don't want yellow as your highlight peaking because all those leaves are yellow. So try to pick a color that doesn't interfere with what you're taking photos of. So, and to get an example of what focus peaking looks like, here I'm focused on this canvas I have on my wall of Black Canyon in Colorado. And if I press and hold a button that I've set, and I'll show you what that is later and how to do that, I get focus peaking. See all the highlighted in red? That's everything that's in focus right now in this frame. Really powerful stuff. And I'll show you how to set that up a little bit later. And by the time we're done setting that up, the A9 will be much more than a actual camera. It'll also be an insanely powerful spotting scope that goes uh, 1880 millimeters. It doesn't take pictures at that value, but it allows you to really look and spy on stuff. You don't need binoculars or a spotting scope anymore. You can just use the A9 and I'll show you that a little bit later. All right, let's go ahead and go to the next page, which is page 13. Oh man, that's the unlucky number. You know, some hotels, they don't actually have a 13th floor. I mean, there really is a 13th floor because it's always there if there's more than 12 floors or, yeah, yeah, I think you get the idea. But Sony didn't remove the 13th page. I guess they don't think it's bad luck. And you might want to take notes on this because this is going to be some serious stuff. Of course, it's on 13, so we're probably going to have bad luck with this. So I'm going to go ahead and go over to 13. And look at that. Actually, <laughs> I'm just messing with you. You don't change anything here. This is all default settings. So if I go one more to the right, it's gonna actually change my main tab into this number two. We're gonna bounce over there and this is movie stuff. We're not setting that up right now. So I'm gonna go ahead and go right through that to page number five within this number two. This is really important stuff here. Shutter type. We want electronic shutter. Electronic shutter is another thing that you have to have set in order to get 20 frames per second. And let me tell you, it's really cool because electronic shutter means there is absolutely no shutter noise at all. The camera is totally silent, which is kind of a bad thing because if you're shooting 20 frames per second and it's totally silent, you have no idea that you just took 500 pictures. Trust me, it happens. So I have the camera set up with audio cues. It'll play just a little teeny click to let me know that I've actually taken a picture. It's really, really important. But if you want to shoot it completely silent, you can. Nobody will ever even know that you're taking a picture. It's really cool. I'm going to come down here to the next setting. It's grayed out. As soon as we um, selected electronic shutter, the electronic front curtain shutter is disabled. We can no longer uh, change that. We're gonna come down to release without lens and select that to disable. Basically, you're telling the camera you don't want it to take a picture without a lens attached. Same with the card, release without card, disable. Basically, you're telling the camera to not take a picture unless there's a card inside. If there's no card, it won't take a picture at this point. Steady shot is on, that's controlled over here on the side of the lens, and the steady shot settings are all default settings. So I'm gonna go ahead and come up and we're gonna to move to page six. All right, we're gonna move over one more to page six of 11, and man, this one's a doozy. You ready for this? Look at that. We're not doing anything here because it's all grayed out. So we're gonna move on to number seven, display auto review. And the first one is this disc button. That means display. And you can do some cool stuff here. I'm gonna show you what I've done. So if you go ahead and click on this, you have two choices. You have monitor and finder. Monitor is the rear screen. Finder is the viewfinder. If you go one more in, you get this nice handy graphical representation and all of these choices. I have display all info selected, no display of info, histogram, and level. So basically what this is saying is when I'm in photo shooting mode, I'll be able to access all of that information with a touch of a button, all of these separately. And I've mirrored those settings for my viewfinder too. So once I have them all set up, I need to come over here and make sure I hit enter on the screen there and push that button. I'm gonna go back in. I'm gonna make sure that my viewfinder has the same stuff. It does. Now I'm gonna show you what this does. When we're looking at the screen, I'm gonna lower this so that picture's not in the way and you can actually see more of the screen. This is the setting for everything. This was one of the things I chose. Every setting that I have the camera currently in is displayed right now. If I wanna get rid of all that information, I just press up on the control wheel. Boom, look at that, nice clear shot. Actually, nothing is displayed. So this is display, no info. If I press up one more time, look at this. I get a live histogram. That's totally awesome. You also get all of these same things, again, in the viewfinder. If I press up one more time, look at this. I get a nice handy level, and look, 
Whoever set up this tripod did an awful job because it is not level. So if I go up one more time, it just cycles back to the beginning, everything. I prefer to have it with pretty much nothing there, but at any time I want, I can recall all of this information with the touch of a button and see exactly what's going on with my camera. Super, super valuable, really, really uh, important. I like to have that feature. All right, the next thing we're gonna change is this finder monitor option. Um, I have it set to monitor manual. Let me explain what's happening with this. By default, when you're using the A9 and you pull it away from your eye, the rear screen comes on every single time. I understand why it's doing that. It's supposed to do that. I personally don't like that. It's chewing up battery. It's wasting my battery power. I don't want the rear screen coming on all the time. I wanna be able to turn it on when I want to. I like doing most of my stuff through the viewfinder anyways. So what I've done is I've set up a custom button to turn the back screen on and off. So I've selected finder monitor, monitor manual, and it will then uh, turn that monitor off. It won't, it won't be coming on automatically anymore. So if you've already made that change, which I suggest you do, we're gonna have to dive in a little bit deeper and set a button to where we can get this monitor back on before we go any further. So I'm gonna go ahead and go over to the right. I'm gonna come into the first time into this custom key. The little picture icon means we're changing the custom keys for photography. That's what we want. I'm gonna come in and look at this. You get this awesome little graphical representation of the camera and we're gonna go over to page two. See that one of four, I want page two of four. And now I have access to these buttons I told you about a long time ago and the control wheel. And I'm gonna set the left side of that to finder monitor select. And when you, when you come in here and you start using the custom menu, you're gonna see, oh my gosh, there's a lot of choices. There's 19 pages. That's because you can set this camera up to do pretty much anything you want except take the picture for you. You still have to do that. You still have to have some kind of understanding of photography. So just remember that. There's a lot of stuff that you can do in here. Don't be overwhelmed by it. Take your time. So with it selected on Finder Monitor Select, I have now programmed this left button to turn on and off my rear screen. And I'll show you what I mean. So if I wanna shut this rear screen off, watch this. Press the left button, it's gone not wasting my battery anymore. If I wanna turn it back on, watch this. There it is. Now there's one caveat to this. If you're within the menu system and you wanted to turn the rear screen on, say you're looking through the viewfinder, you can't do it while you're in the menu system because the left button is now for navigating. It no longer works in that function. If you are reviewing your images and you wanted to turn the rear screen on, and remember, I'm trying to tell you that you're doing this through the viewfinder, you can't turn the rear screen on while you're reviewing images because you're able to now cycle through your images. So if you're in any one of these modes, you wanna turn the rear screen on, it's really easy. Half press the shutter button to get out and then you can activate or deactivate that rear screen. All right, so I'm gonna go backwards again. We're leaving the custom menu, um, the custom button configuration because we still have some stuff we need to do here. We've already done the disc button and we've already changed the finder monitor um, to manual. We want the finder frame rate, that's the viewfinder's frame rate, to be high. That makes fast moving things look a little bit more realistic. Zebra setting, this is not some magical setting that will automatically expose perfectly for zebras because zebras are actually challenging to photograph because they're white and black. It's hard to get both. That's not what this means. Zebra setting is an overlay on the screen that tells you when certain things are exposed improperly. We're gonna set that to a button a little later so I'm not messing with that right now. I have this grid line set to rule of thirds grid. That's a personal preference. I'll show you what that is. See these lines that dice or make the screen into nine even pieces. That's the rule of thirds grid. I use that for composing stuff when I want an interesting composition. So I'm gonna come back into the menu. This exposure set guide I have set to off. All right, we're gonna move one more page over to the right. So we're gonna jump from seven to eight. And the first selection is live view display. We want setting effect on. And what that is, is you'll be able to see all of your exposure settings in the viewfinder, things like exposure compensation, ISO, all that stuff you'll be able to view live with that setting is on. The shoot start display, I have set to off. The shoot timing display on type one, it's a default setting, I haven't done anything there. This continuous shoot length I have is not displayed. So what that is, if 
Say your buffer on this camera is 200 pictures. So you can take 200 pictures before the camera starts to slow down. If you fire off 50 shots, this would display that you had 150 pictures left before it starts to slow down. I never take that many in a burst. Um, it's, for what I do, it's just not really necessary. So I don't have that displayed. The next thing you wanna do is come down to this auto review and you wanna have that selected to off. What auto review is, is every time you take an image, it will automatically be played back on either the rear screen, even though we just turned it off, so that won't be happening. Then it'll be coming in the viewfinder. So it's automatically would show the image every time you take a shot. It's a waste of battery. I'm only gonna look at the images when I want to. So I turn that to off. Whew, we've been doing a lot of stuff. I've thrown a lot of information at you and I'm being serious here. This is a good time to take a break. Um, go back and check out some of the stuff I've already done if you didn't understand it. Go take a walk, go get some coffee, get a snack, whatever you wanna do. Because from this point on, we're gonna start tying everything that we've already done together with some custom buttons. So it's kinda like, reminds me of the scene in the Matrix. From this point, like the main guy in the Matrix, he had a decision to make. He could take a red pill that would take him further down the rabbit hole and expose what reality really was. Or he could take the blue pill and just be happy where he was right now. So from this point on, we're gonna be taking the red pill. We're going far down in the rabbit hole and we're gonna actually start syncing all this stuff up. So go take a break. All right, nice break. <laughs> so here we go, you ready? Let's get into the menu and we're gonna start changing some custom settings. So again, I, I told you this earlier, we want the first one. We're on page actually nine of 11 and we want this custom key for images. So we're gonna go ahead and click on that. And the very first one that we've highlighted is the control wheel. I have it set to white balance. So let me show you what this actually does. So when you're shooting a picture, if you wanted to change the white balance, you can actually just change you know, the dial, the control wheel, and it will cycle through all of your different white balance values. You don't have to do anything other than turn the dial. You don't have to press a button to confirm it. You turn the dial, it's automatically set up. You can change, uh, you can set up this control wheel to do whatever you want. It could be your shutter speed, your exposure compensation, whatever is best for you. I put my white balance on there because that's where I want it. So we're gonna go in and we're gonna show you the next button that we're gonna change. This one is really important and we're gonna go really far into some interesting stuff here. So button number two, which is actually the AEL button in the top right corner. We're going to go ahead and click on that and we're gonna find page four of 24 and we want reg AF area plus AF on. What that stands for is registered autofocus area and autofocus on. So I'm gonna go ahead and select that. And it's funny because we haven't actually registered a focus area, an alternate focus area yet. So we need to do that in order to take full benefit of this feature. So to do that, we're gonna come back in to photo shooting mode, and we're gonna press a button and go into a menu that we haven't yet. This little teeny FN button right here, the FN button, always getting in the way. So we're gonna press that, boom, and it opens up an entire new menu. Um, and I, the way I set this camera up, we're probably never gonna come in here again. I'm gonna set everything up with just one touch of a button. But here's what we need to do. We need to register an alternate focus area. So you can see I already have focus area selected. So I'm gonna go ahead and press the center button, and I'm gonna come down and I want tracking flexible spot L. So what I've just done is I have changed my, um, my focus area to this tracking flexible spot L. And you can see me moving it around here. So zone is now gone. And I wanna register this focus area as my secondary focus area. And to do that, I have to long hold this FN button until this appears on the screen, right? registered the focus area. So now my registered focus area is this um, tracking spot L. That's cool, we're gonna recall that in another button. So we don't want it to be our main focus area. So we're gonna come back into the effing button again, this little effing button. I'm gonna press that. I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna turn on zone. So zone is now my default focus area. But here's the cool thing. We're gonna go back into the menu, ready? We're gonna go back into the custom key. Remember what we set it up to do? We set it up to recall that registered focus area, which is our secondary focus, and autofocus at the same time. So now, if you're shooting an image and you wanted to recall that tracking, you hold the AEL button in and boom, you've got this tracking feature 
which didn't track anything on the wall because there's nothing there. There you go. So now the, it's locked on that. And no matter where I go, it's gonna stay locked on that spot. That's the tracking mode of the A9. It's really powerful. So now I have just set a completely alternate focus area and autofocus to another button. And look at that, as soon as I let go of it, it's gone. So I can access that entire focus system, tracking, so cool, at the touch of another button. All right, let's jump back into the custom key now that we've got this alternate focus area. And we're gonna go down to button number three, which is AF on. You're gonna click that, you're gonna find page five of 24, and you're gonna select AF on. And let me explain to you what's happening here. So I'm gonna go back into shooting. Man, look at that picture. You know, I did a video on this. My son and I hiked out to this ledge. It was one of the scariest hikes I've ever done. I think we were like a mile up, a river down going below, and the sun right there. Okay, enough of that nonsense. So I've just put focus on AF on. And if you remember, our default focus was zone. So if I press and hold AF on, it's activating zone. I let go. My plane of focus is now locked where those little green squares just were. If I wanted to use the alternate focus area, I simply pull my thumb to the right and I hold in the AEL button. So now I have two different focus modes right at my fingertips. I never have to take my eye from the viewfinder or my subject. That is so cool. Totally powerful, super awesome. All right, we're gonna dive back into the custom key where we've been spending a little bit of time. And we're gonna come down, whoops, wrong way. We're gonna come down to button number four, which is actually the C3 button, and I'm not even using it. And I'll explain why. When I'm shooting, a lot of times my right hand is here, my left hand is on the barrel of the lens. Look, I can't even get to the C3 button. It's, in my experience, it's kind of pointless. So hey, Sony, if, if you're watching, put this button somewhere else, over here. I mean, for lefties, it would probably be challenging, but yeah, that's, I don't like that, it's no good. So we're gonna move on. All right, we're still in the custom key section. We're gonna come down to number five, which is actually the garbage can or for you people on the other side of the pond, the rubbish bin. <laughs> um, and I set it to register AF area toggle. So let me show you what that does. So while we're in photo shooting mode, if I press, I'm gonna pull it down so you can see the screen a little bit better. If I press the rubbish can or the garbage can, I've toggled to my second focus area. I press it again, I toggle back to zone, press it again, it's a toggle. Um, it's nice to have, and honestly, I rarely ever use it because I've mapped these two buttons to those focus modes anyways. All right, so we're gonna change button number one, which is actually this little joystick. If you press this joystick in, you actually, it's like pressing a button, and I have that set to metering mode. So let me show you what this does. While I'm taking a picture, if I wanna change my metering mode, I just press in that button, and I can now scroll through all the wonderful metering modes. That's pretty cool. All right, let's move into the next button that we're gonna be setting up. And this one is super powerful. I talked about this earlier, and that's gonna be the center button. We're gonna recall custom hold one. And earlier, I showed you a way to basically have a completely different camera at the touch of a button. It can change your shutter speed, your aperture, pretty much everything or anything that you can change with a dial or a menu, you can assign to this button. And now I've just put it right here. So for me, this is my perched bird setting, I would call it. It drops my shutter speed and changes a few other values. So I'll give you a quick demonstration. Here's like the default. If I press and hold this, it's gonna lower my shutter speed and it did to one 500th of a second. It's activating spot metering and this tiny little spot focus spot. I let go, comes right back to where I was. Really, really powerful stuff. All right, so we've already set up the finder monitor select. We did that a little bit ago. The next one would be the right quadrant of the control wheel. I have set to ISO. So what happens if I'm in image shooting mode and I press to the right? Look at this, I can scroll through all my ISO values and see the effects of the ISO in real time. Man, that's totally cool. And again, that's right here on the right. Boom, I'm gonna come back into my menu now. And we're gonna go to the next one which is AF tracking sensitivity, that's down. We talked about that quite a bit earlier. So if I come in here, I'm in photo shooting mode and I press down, I can alter the tracking sensitivity, although I keep it locked at one at all times. All right, we're gonna come back in. Man, that's a lot of stuff. 
All right, number three, or yeah, page three of four deals with two buttons on top of the camera. These buttons are labeled C1 and 2. So I have set C1 for my zebra display selecting, and I'll show you what that looks like. So if we're in here, I'm gonna focus on this, and I activate zebra, you can see all the zebra stripes. Woo! That's a pretty cool effect, man. Where's the music? That's pretty crazy. All right, so that helps you with exposure. I'm gonna go ahead and turn it off because honestly, it just kind of gets in the way and annoys me. I'm not a huge fan of it, but if, I'll use it if I need to. The other button that I set up in that same area was two, and that's switch. I have it set to switch focus area, and you can find that on page three of 24. I'm gonna go ahead and back up. I didn't show you where zebra was. You can find zebra on page 17 of 24. So this other button, the switch focus area, all it will do is cycle through all of my focus areas, all three of them. Remember, we limited it to three. So if I press it, look, it just moves from one to the next, back to the next. Pretty cool stuff. All right, we got one more page, and man, it's full of choices. Whew. It's gonna take a little while. You ready? Look at that, it's actually just one button. <laughs> and it's the button on the side of the lens. And I'm using here, I'm gonna go ahead and take this off so I can show you. Half press that. Turn off my monitor, all these cool button settings I have. If I get it out of the tripod. See this button right here? There's actually three of them. One, two, three. They all do the same thing. So while I'm holding this camera, I can press that button to activate this function. And this is that super spotting scope thing I was telling you about. Man, this is so cool. Let me show you how it works. Go ahead and put my camera back in here. Come back into the viewfinder so we can see what's going on. I'm gonna focus right there. Boom, I got focus on the river. And I already showed you earlier, when I press this button on here, it's not a toggle, it's a hold. You have to hold this button, look at that. I can see focus peaking. Now here comes the super spotting scope, get ready for this. If I barely turn this dial, the focus dial on the lens right here, watch this, watch what happens. It's gonna magnify the entire scene 4.8 seven times, so it goes from 400 millimeters to 1880. Look at that, man, you could spy a mountain goat on the ridge there, and I think, wait a minute, look, is that Bigfoot? Oh man, I think we got Bigfoot, check him out on there. Oh, wait, I turned off the zoom, you can't see it anymore, huh? But you see the idea, this turns the A9 into an amazingly powerful spotting scope to spot stuff far, far, far away. I use it all the time on workshops when I'm trying to lead people up to birds, I can see a bird way off in the distance. I can do this button. I can turn that dial and I can see it like a mile away. And I go, oh man, there's a spoonbill up here. And they're like, well, how'd you know? I'm like, eh. Got the Sony A9, that's how I knew. So it's really powerful, super cool. One thing I have to mention about it, if um, when, you, when you do this, this control ring or the focus ring is super, super sensitive. You just barely have to touch it, man. Just, I mean, just a hair. And then once it zooms into this 1880, you're massively magnified. It takes a little bit to get used to moving. You have to really slow down all of your movements because again, it's massively magnified. All right, we got a little bit more to go to. We're actually done with all the custom buttons. That's a big part of all of this. So you can congratulate yourself. You've made it this far, the A9, is a high-tech camera, it's highly computerized. That's why I'm here to help you with it. So we're gonna go to the right one more time. And we're gonna come into Custom Operation 2, page 10 of 11. The ATV, AVTV rotate, that's default. This is default, this is default. This is something I've changed. Function of touch operation is touch focus. So I've changed this to touch focus. So if I'm on the in shooting mode and I touch the back of the screen, Wherever I touch, I can drag my finger around and it will try to focus on that spot that I just touched, wherever I go, it's pretty cool. So you can do that when you're in the viewfinder too. You can take your finger and move it across and focus on all kinds of different little points. That's what that setting was. So I'm gonna come back into the menu. Now this is probably the only thing on this camera that I don't like, and that's the movie button. You can see it right here. This little teeny button starts recording videos and it's right next to the AF on button. And I think for the first week I had it, I accidentally recorded about a dozen movies. They turned out pretty good, but I didn't want to record movies when I did that. So this setting actually disables that button 
unless you are specifically in movie mode, which is you gotta change a dial on the top to get there. So I highly suggest that you put this in movie mode only. And what happens when you hit this button, when um, it's set like this, you get a warning message on the screen that says, invalid in this mode, available in movie mode. So nothing happened, which is good. You know, didn't mess you up. So that's really important. And then we got one more, I think, setting to change. We're gonna go over to this next page. We want all audio signals on. That's how you know you're taking a picture, that simulated shutter sound. It's very important. The network, um, I don't do a lot here. In fact, I have airplane mode turned on to conserve battery. I know some people that use the full network functions of this camera and you can do amazing stuff with it. I went out with a gentleman, <clears throat> his name is Michael, um, from Hong Kong, and in fact, he's the one that introduced me to the A9. He has it set up to when he takes the pictures, it automatically wirelessly transfers through FTP, I think it was FTP, to his phone and I believe to his iPad. So he can take the shots. By the time he gets back to his device, he's got them on there and he can look through them. Pretty cool stuff. I don't use that, so I choose to have airplane mode on just to conserve some battery power. All right, I'm gonna make one more change. Anything I've skipped is all default settings. So I've moved all the way up to the network. I'm gonna go over really quick to the two, which is the toolbox. I'm gonna to come down. I want page two of seven. I'm gonna do touch operation on. That allows you to actually touch that back screen and move it around like I said. And then the next one, touch panel slash pad. I want the value to be touch panel plus pad. That tells me to, or tells the camera that you wanna, um, either in the viewfinder or the monitor, you wanna be able to touch that rear screen. If you find that maybe your nose hits the rear screen and moves stuff around while you're viewing uh, or taking shots, you might wanna turn this off. And the touchpad settings, they're all the default value that was already set from the factory. Congratulations, that completes the setup of the A9, at least how I set it up. Now I'm gonna talk about something, don't leave yet, because this is really important. I'm gonna talk about the different focus areas that I've chosen, when you should use them, and when you shouldn't use them. And by default, I've chosen zone. Zone is very fast, it's very accurate, it works about 99% of the time, I love it. You can tell zone um, on the back screen here. You've got these four corners, those are the outer, uh, perimeter of zone. So anything within inside that square, the camera will try to focus on. So I can have that camera at my side. A bird can fly up. I can go up really fast. It's really easy to keep that big focus area on the subject. I hold in the AF on button. It grabs focus, keeps it in focus. I fire away. Um, like I said, it works pretty much 99% of the time. There's a few instances where zone might not work. Now, say you're taking a trying to take a picture of, um, I don't know, a moose or a bear, or maybe an elephant, and the elephant or your subject is pretty large inside that whole square, and zone might try to choose a different part of the animal that you want. It might focus on the animal's butt, and I mean, unless you're making a, a book with animal butts, you probably don't want that. You probably want the animal's face. So there are times when zone will pick the wrong spot, that's why we've chosen this AEL on the other button. That allows you to pick a smaller space right in the middle, and then you can pinpoint that focus. Now there's some other instances where zone might give you trouble, and that's if there is another object that's in that actual zone with your intended subject. Things like tree branches, um, foliage, flowers, grass, all of that stuff might confuse zone if it's in the same focus area as your subject. And again, that's why I've set this other button to have a more pinpoint lock on focus for those situations. Another example is like if you're laying low in the grass and you're taking pictures of animals in the grass or in some flowers, zone will probably grab the flowers and grass in the foreground before it grabs your subject. Again, that's what the other focus area is for. Zone will also have trouble if your subject is close to the surface of the water, but only if the water surface is ripply. If the water surface is smooth and like glass, zone has no issues. It'll focus on the reflection or the subject or both. If the water is ripply, zone will get confused and focus on those ripples and it's easy to see why. Those ripples are constantly moving and they're constantly changing and light and contrast. It looks like a moving, living creature. So it's easy to see why zone would do that. Again, in those situations, I would choose 
um, my AEL button, which has the tracking um, with the flexible spot large. There's some instances where I wouldn't use that, and there's a reason why I've chosen zone as my default. That tracking is a little bit slower to activate and actually lock. It just takes a little bit of time, a little bit longer than zone. So that's why I have zone as my default. Um, the tracking is also harder to actually acquire that initial tracking because it's a small area. It's not like very difficult, it's just harder. So that's why it's my secondary focus area. I will use that though, if I'm trying to capture a bird that's coming out of the sky and coming down to the water or the ground and then back up, I'll use that lock, I'll put the bird right in the center of the frame, I'll hold in my AEL button, it'll acquire the lock on the bird, and then it's my job at that point to keep that button held in and keep the bird in my frame. And it will keep the bird in focus all the way down into the water, onto the ground, sometimes even back out. Um, sometimes if they go underwater, of course, you're in that Ripley section, you'll have to reacquire focus when they come out. Very powerful, and it's really powerful to have both of them on separate buttons that you can just move really fast like that. So it's up to you to remember all of that and learn where these two different focus areas will be the best for you and your style of shooting. I, there's something I wanna show you really quick before we end this. And I don't know if this is a glitch or if it's intended purpose, but I'm gonna show you what it is and how to rectify it in case it happens to you. We have these two focus areas set up and we had the garbage can set to toggle between the two. That's all good, no problems. If you toggle to that registered focus area and say you move it around with the joystick or your thumb and then you acquire focus by pressing the AF on, our zone, our default uh, focus area of zone is now gone. If you toggle, it's gonna toggle between this middle focus area and the one that we just moved. Man, and that's no good, we've lost zone. So you need to make sure that it's back to the one that you moved and you press the C2 button, which was on the top. And that C2 button will cycle through our focus areas. The first one is zone. So if you press that C2 button, you've got zone right back to where you were and everything is right back to the way it was. Again, I'm not sure if this is actually the intended design or if that's some type of glitch, but either way, it's pretty easy to handle and, and fix. So now you have it. That's how I set up, that's how I use the A9. Um, do it all without taking my eye from the viewfinder, just by touching some buttons on there. And you might've noticed that I didn't even ever mention Sony's high autofocus, and I'll tell you why. All right, hey, check it out, that's my son there. He's been doing all this filming, so thank him for that. I make him do all this hard work, poor guy. But I'm gonna talk about the eye autofocus. You notice he's just not in focus if I press and hold the AF on button, watch what happens. Oh my gosh, eye autofocus just works right out of the box. There's nothing you have to do to activate it. It just works and it's brilliant at that. And you can see it actually switches around. Pretty cool stuff. Don't have to do anything to make it work. That's why I didn't even talk about it. Thanks for sticking around to the end. As I said in the very beginning, the entire contents of this video is also available as a digital ebook. You can get it on my website below. It's not necessary, but it's a great way to help support me and what I do in all of these videos. And I'd like to thank every single one of you for all the the great encouragement and support that I've had over the couple of years I've been doing these YouTube videos. It's very helpful to me. Um, it's always nice hearing what everybody has to say about all this stuff. If you have any questions about any of the stuff I talked about in this video, go ahead and leave a comment. I'll do my best to answer those. Hit the thumbs up, subscribe, all that good stuff. I got a lot of good stuff planned. I'm getting ready to head out west to Colorado, to the state of Washington, to the Grand Tetons. I'm gonna go shoot with some other photographers out there. Man, it's gonna be a great time. I can't wait to take every single one of you along with me.